Well, good day to you. It is the 30th of March, and I hope you're having a wonderful day wherever you are. If this is your first time ever listening to Search for Signs, uh, let me introduce myself real quick. My name is Gary Willing, and what we talk about here is we talk about the emergence of Maitreya and the Masters of Wisdom. Now, we take a deeper look at who and what Maitreya is, and uh, through the process of negative comments and then me commenting on those negative comments... We take a deeper look at who and what Maitreya is not. <laughs> now, we talk about why are the masters and the teacher returning now to the everyday world, and why is it so important that they're returning now, not a 1,000 or 1,200 years from now, but right at this moment in time, right? And what does it mean for not only you, but for everyone in the world, and for the religious groups and for the non-religious groups? Now, we tie it into the two most important things that we could discuss on this channel. The first is the miracle signs that have been going on. There's a reason why I named this channel Search for Signs. And if you search for these miracles, you'll actually find them. The teacher said it. Those who search for signs will find them. So you'll find them if you just look for them. You might have had some of these experiences happen to yourself. You might have experienced these firsthand or not. It doesn't matter. Um, you can go online and you can do your own research and see that these miracles have been going on all over the world. So I'm not just making it up. But um, they are signs of something. And I do think that these miracles are evidence of a few things. One, they're evidence that all the religious groups are linked, you know, whether they're unaware of it or not. And also that there's hope for humanity, whether you're religious or non-religious, because they're happening to everyone. So when Christians are having their own experiences like weeping icons, crosses of light, they might be unaware that the Hindus are having miracles like the Hindu milk miracle. So why would they be having those miracles too if the Christians are 100% right? Do you see what I'm saying? So they, they are evidence that they're linked. And because those people who have had these experiences happen to them uh, are always left with a greater sense of hope, I would say in a world where it just seems like the news just keeps getting worse on a daily basis, right? They're evidence of hope. So a brief list of these miracles that you can do your own research and look at uh, healing waters like Talakoti, Mexico, crosses of light like El Monte, California or Copper Ridge Baptist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee, patterns of light that happen all over the world, uh, Crop patterns, you know, they used to be called crop circles, but that doesn't really do them justice anymore because the patterns are quite intricate, right? And you can look and see those. UFO activity, the Norwegian spiral, lights over Jerusalem, people who claim to have been saved by an accident by an angel or have been helped by an angel from time to time. There are reports of disappearing hitchhikers that claim that the Christ is already back in the world and then disappear in the car and that kind of thing. Um, the events of Ni in Nairobi, Kenya in June of 1988, where the teacher appeared out of the blue to about five or 6,000 uh, Christian fundamentalists and then disappeared in the same way that he appeared. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And it might help trigger a miracle or two that's happened in your life that you didn't contribute to anything other than just a strange occurrence, right? You might start to remember something like, ooh, wait a minute. And if you have had these miracles happen to you, ask yourself, were you left with a greater sense of hope after you were healed from or saved from an accident by what you thought an angel? Or were you left with a greater sense of hope uh, by seeing a UFO perhaps or seeing patterns, uh, crop patterns and, and seeing that as evidence of UFO activity? Did that give you a greater sense of hope? Well, I think it probably did. But anyway, so... The other thing that you might think it as a stretch, but these miracles, I think, are also pointing to the fact that the teacher who made a promise to come back at some point, made a promise to the Christians to come back as the Christ, as the promise to the uh, Muslims to come back as the Imam Mahdi and so forth, is already here and has already taken further steps in approach, his approach to humanity 
by actually going on TV and giving interviews on TV. Now, of course, in true uh, Christ fashion, he's not claiming to be the Christ or the Imam Mahdi. He is just presenting himself as an ordinary person with very simple solutions to our ever-complex problems, really. And so, in time, more and more of us will recognize uh, Maitreya on TV. He's not using the name Maitreya, but eventually we'll, more and more of us will recognize him. Now, the other thing, too, <clears throat> is why are the masters returning now? Why is it so important that they're returning now, right? Well, you couldn't really talk about that unless you talked about the most important thing that we talk about on this channel, and that is the priorities of Maitreya, that he's laid out for humanity, that humanity must look at and must do something about. Now, Maitreya's biggest priority for humanity at this moment in time is humanity must create peace. Our very survival depends on it militarily because there are nations that uh, have nuclear weapons and they could always be used at any time. There's always a possibility they could be used until war is behind us forever as a possibility, right? The other, pos the other reason, I think, which is Less obvious but more likely is that nations must learn to trust one another in a peaceful way in order to tackle things like the saving the environment. So a nation or two here or there that might not trust all the other nations can't solve the environmental problem on its own. And nations like the United States that figure, well, well, shoot, if China's not going to do it, well, then shoot, we're not going to do anything about it either. So, you know, go F it, right? That doesn't work either. We have to learn to trust one another. Now, the solution that the teacher has given humanity for uh, how to create peace is quite simple. Just as simple as what Jesus said, what you sow shall, shall you reap, talking about the universal law of cause and effect. You would think that peace is nearly impossible, but the teacher laid it out very simply. He says, without sharing, there could be no justice. Without justice, there could be no peace. And without peace, there could be no future. Now, Let's look at the first part, and we'll kind of tie it into the last part, right? Well, the principle of sharing is not capitalism, of course. It's not communism, and it's not socialism. It's something entirely different. Socialism, communism, and capitalism are nothing more than three economic ideologies, is all. This is not an ideology. This is a natural way that we should all be living, because the resources of the world are here really for everyone, not just for, the, just for those ambitious enough folks to that hoard it for themselves so the principle of sharing is a is should be done on a national and international level so nations should take the excesses that they have and give it freely to other nations to help those nations because every nation has needs and excesses so nations like the united states could give it to other nations and then those smaller nations that have more needs but less excesses it could still give an excess or two back as payment for what they took. <clears throat> now, you might doubt how that this would even create peace. Well, historically it did. And the principle of sharing was not called the principle of sharing. It was called the Marshall Plan. And it happened to amongst a few nations right after World War II, the United States and Western European nations. And it didn't happen ongoingly. It eventually stopped. But initially, it rebuilt Western Europe. It stabilized things politically and socially. Once those nations gave the excesses that they took back in, to the United States as payment, it created an economic boom here in the United States. Also, the one thing that really nobody talks about, so you're getting this kind of relatively uh, new information about this, but eventually people will look at it as, oh, well, that makes sense. The United States and those nations that participated in the Marshall Plan trust one another better than they do with any other nations on the planet. And trust and peace go hand in hand, right? You can't have peace without trust, and you can't have trust without peace, right? So it created trust amongst those nations. It created goodwill amongst those nations. It wasn't perfect, but that we'd have a more peaceful, trusting relationship with those nations than any other nations on the planet 75 or so years after the principle of sharing ended. Now, I'll leave you with this, okay? <clears throat> Two things. One, when Maitreya says, without peace there could be no future, it's not a future of more of the same. Quite extraordinarily better than it is today. One, it would be a future with, the end, with no hunger, 
It'd be a, a future where people feel that their lives matter and fulfilled. A future of simple honesty and creativity. A future where we where we trust one another and we don't fear one another the way that we do. So that's initially. And then eventually, over time, it will lead humanity to the farthest reaches of our galaxy and exploration. So we don't know the f- future and the possibility of what it means to be human on this planet. And we will never know until we start sharing the resources of the world and quit hoarding it. So now the, the other thing I want to say too, um, is it's not important to really look at this information from a religious point of view, but to really look at it from the, the priority of Maitreya of peace. And why is it so important? You know, if you're a Christian, ask yourself as that as a Christian, if you're a Christian, uh, ask yourself, would Jesus tolerate and, and allow people to die of hunger every day? You know, the Jesus that you know and the Jesus that I, I know in the Bible would not. He would stand up against it. He would be, you know, protesting against hunger, against injustice. Well, he, he said, feed my sheep, right? So, I mean, the same thing. It's just... Now it's feed the hungry, you know, in the, around the world. Those people didn't know anything about the people that lived in Africa or in the United, you know, the North America or something like that, right? They just, they knew only Palestine. So he was only speaking to people of very limited knowledge. Now the teacher is speaking to the whole world. And so his call to humanity is going to be a call to the whole world to help save the world, not just to feed my sheep, you know, kind of thing. So hopefully that helps. Now, if you have a question you want to answer, at, want answered about this this topic, simply post your question as a comment. You can email me at searchforsigns at mail.com. That's another way of doing it. And also, if you're somebody who uh, doesn't like to ask questions publicly, that's fine. Just go and look at some of the links that I've put in the description and you can start to answer your own questions by you know, reading some of this background information. I do recommend, as always, going to the Share International website. I think that's the best source of information about Maitreya and the Masters of Wisdom. It's the best source of information talking about these miracles and seeing images of these miracles and the authenticity of these miracles and so forth. And you can also um, perhaps get some of Benjamin Krem's books if you so choose. You can see videos coming from Benjamin Krem and really hear about this information uh, in a way that you couldn't any other way, any other way, including this channel. So, all right. Cause I found out about this information from Benjamin Krem. So you might as well go to the source. <laughs> um, now, uh, the two questions that I have to cover in this video, the first one, uh, is do you follow Maitreya? Well, in what way do you mean, Jose? <clears throat> do you mean, do I run after him and chase after him? Well, no, I don't look um, for instance, a good example would be those people when Benjamin Krem made the announcement that Maitreya uh, gave his first interview back in January of 2010, scores of people just went all throughout the internet and trying to find any information, any video, any website linking to his, his video, and they lost him. Maitreya says, those who chase after me have lost me right? So don't follow him in that way, right? Follow his teachings. You want for the world what he's advocating for the world, and that's what's important, right? So do I want for the world what Maitreya is advocating for the world? Absolutely, right? Um, Do I try, do I follow his teachings perfectly? No, I'm just like everybody else, but I try, and I get back up, and I try again, and then I fail, and I get back up, and I try again. I mean, that's following his teachings. But you can follow the teachings of Muhammad. You can follow the teachings of Jesus. If you really look at it uh, from the perspective that they should be looked at, then you'll be following the teachings of Maitreya in the same way. So does that answer that question? (laughs) And then, you know, I always like to talk about this because I think it's a wonderful teaching that Maitreya gave me. But years and years ago, I saw Maitreya on the street corner. And there, if you want to know more about this or any of my other experiences with Maitreya, I have a playlist where I put these videos up. But he said to me, he goes, I never judge anyone on whether they're good or bad. I only notice the good things that they do. Well, initially I thought about it in the way of, well, the Christ is coming back not as a judge, but as a, 
a lover of humanity. That's true, right? I do think that he meant it in that way as well. But over the years that I thought about him saying that, I started to realize that that could be the key to loving unconditionally. And that's going to lead me to my next question about the masters and how to become a master. Somebody asked me how to become a master. So anyway, I'll, I'll read this to you and then we'll tie it back into what I just said. It says, hi, Gary, I trust you are well. Love your videos. I can listen to you all day. Can you explain mankind's evolution and the process of initiation on how you become a master, what ascension really is, and how we can ascend and the masters ascended? It's a big question. That's for sure it is. <laughs> but maybe you can help me tie up some loose ends. Again, thank you for sharing this important awareness with us. Much love and blessings to you. And I am well. Thank you for asking too, by the way, Jacqueline. Okay, so... Uh, to answer your question, can you, can I explain Maitreya's, or ma I'm sorry, can you explain mankind's evolution and the process of initiation and how you become a master? To truly answer that question, I would have to say, no, I can't because I am a person just like you. Okay. I'm still in the process of becoming a master. I can point you in the right direction, I think, to the ageless wisdom teachings, which talk about it at great length, the writings of Alice Bailey, coming from the master Joao Kool, and the writings of Benjamin Krem coming from another master who shall be re remain nameless for a time, but um, just known as Benjamin Krem's master. You can get a greater sense of, of the steps that we will all be taking in order to become a master. So I would, say, and then you can also read the Bible if you look at it from the ageless wisdom, you know, from an esoteric view and not from a religious dogma view, you can you get the same, you know, a very broad sense, uh, the teachings that will help you to become a master. For one, for instance, Jesus talked about what? The, the um, law of cause and effect, which you sow shall, shall you reap, right? If you truly lived harmless within the law, you would eventually move rather quickly up the ladder and become a master because all the masters live within that law perfectly. They are harmless. They don't harm one another. They don't harm us. They don't infringe upon our free will at any level. So, you know, the teachings of Jesus is in there too. The teachings of the Buddha is in there. The teachings of, of Benjamin Krem and Alice Bailey talk about it as well. And the, in, the, in the coming time, the teachings of the teacher Maitreya will talk at greater length about the law of cause and effect because it's a law that governs all of us without exception. So... Um, that's one, right? Now, Alice Bailey talked at great length about the requirements to take each one of these uh, expansions of consciousness. There's five to become a master. And what does it mean for the person, right? You can look in the Bible uh, where, you know, she talked about it too, that there were um, points in Jesus's life that were symbols for the five great expansions of consciousness, that we will all take to become a master. The first is the birth, marked by a person's control over their physical nature. The second is the baptism, marked by the person's control over their desire nature, or astral nature. Um, the third, which is the, uh, the transfiguration in the Bible, uh, is marked by the person's control over their um, mental uh, vehicle. Fourth is the crucifixion of the, in the Bible, marked by the person's renunciation of all that is material and so forth, and the pain thereof that comes from that, from eons and eons and eons of living life as a regular person and then having to renounce all that. And then the fifth, of course, is you become a master, in the, and that's the resurrection. And then ascension, they talk about the ascended masters. That's another step for a master uh, called, it's really when, it's just the next initiation that a master would take. But, you know, to put it into perspective, this might help you, quote unquote, tie up the loose ends, especially if you're trying to figure out where you are on that ladder. As Benjamin Krem always said, it's better to know. It's not so important to know where you're at specifically. It's just it's better to know where you're not. <laughs> OK, so it's there are just a handful of masters who have taken the fifth initiation still living on this planet. I think uh, maybe like 50-ish, you know, so not very many. And in the, in the modern world, there's one in 
Tokyo, New York, Darjeeling, London, um, and Geneva, Moscow, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Beijing, Paris, maybe a couple other places. So, I mean, not very many. <laughs> and then my trade is, you know, in London, some kind of way and traveling the world, giving interviews, I guess. But for the most part, very, very, very tiny amount of masters at this moment in time. And then those who have taken the fourth initiation, there's only about 400 or so. Those who have taken the third, about two to 3,000. Those who have taken the second, about a quarter of a million. And those who have taken even just the first initiation, still under a million. So 850,000 or 800 and something thousand people. Not very many. So one out of every 5,000 people have taken the first initiation or something like that. So very tiny amount. Now, a person who has taken the first initiation, this might put it into perspective, um, for the most part might be quite unknown. They might not be doing much in their life in terms of notoriety or even serving, right? But they have a tremendous desire to serve on some level, right? And then as they start to be more advanced uh, disciple between the first and second initiation, they might become more known for something, you know, so people like John Lennon, Princess Diana, um, Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Um, but the average world leader, according to Benjamin Crumb's master, is somewhere between the middle, middle part of the first initiation, between the first and the second, somewhere around halfway. That's the average world leader that is on the screen, uh, on the world today. So, you know, president of a major, you know, this doesn't mean that every president of the United States was in that level, but the, if you look at the average number, you know, the average president, all the presidents, you know, the 45 presidents that we are 46 now, uh, the average is somewhere between halfway between the first and second initiation. So far from perfect, <laughs> right? So, but anyway, that's that. And then as they move up to the second level or second initiation, um, they're, influence on humanity in whatever area they're in is is far exceeded and people like picasso J, john f kennedy roosevelt president roosevelt um let's see who else uh gandhi martin luther king had tremendous influence on their time and even to this day like picasso his art still is influencing people have taken the second initiation now, the, um, in the Bible, it says, in the coming time, out of the mouths of babes shall speak the truth. Well, that, those are people who have just taken the first two initiations. From the master's point of view, they're still considered infants. And as Benjamin Krem used to always say, if they're the little ones, people like Einstein, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, if they're the little ones, what are the big boys like? That's what he used to always say. And then it moves up to the third initiation, which is very rare indeed at this moment in time, um, uh, the Transfiguration initiation. And that, those are people like Mozart, Abraham Lincoln, the Apostle John, Paul, Peter, um, Rembrandt, uh, Beethoven, you know, to name a few. Um, trying to think who else. Um, the Prophet Muhammad. They, they had all taken the third initiation. So you can see the, the level of whatever they were doing as being even greater than somebody like Einstein, right? And then unbelievably rare, rare indeed, are those people who have taken the fourth initiation or the crucifixion or, uh, initiation. Jesus was a fourth degree initiate when he was Jesus in Palestine. Helena Vavatsky. Krishnamurti, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, very, very, very advanced members of humanity, but, you know, still yet not a master. And then, but not long after that, they became a master. And then you have the master who was Jesus, the master who was Paul, the master who was John, those kind of things. Those are, those are masters. So, but the, the thing of it is, Jacqueline, and I want to kind of leave you with this, you know, I unfortunately can't answer that question honestly, Right what it's like to be a master, because I'm still struggling with it the same way you are, right? You could very easily become a master before me or somebody else, or I, you know, somebody else could be a master before both of us. You just, you know, it, you know what I'm saying? So it's just, we're all in the same process, but time really doesn't matter, right? Now, 
when we see these masters out in the world, we will have a much better example of what it means to be a master. And then we can start to emulate that. So the ideas in, in the mystical approach that, that writers have had throughout the years about the quote-unquote ascended masters, it's just that mystical view. It's not a real view of what a master is. When we see these masters, we'll see someone who loves unconditionally, right? Who interacts with people who, who love them and hate them in the same way. You know, think of the writings and the teachings of Jesus, or not the writings, but think of the teachings of Jesus. I mean, that's how they're going to be re- interacting with the political leaders of today, the economic leaders of today, you know, working on beautification of our cities in that way. I mean, it's just, but that's how they're going to, that's how they're going to interact. And you can, I'm sure we'll all identify with one or more or a couple, three of them and go, wow, I want to be like him, <laughs> you know, and because innately we desire to become a you know to become divine just as the masters are divine you see what i'm saying does that answer the question a little bit but if i can leave you with this and hopefully you'll listen to this all the way through but maitreya said to me one time i never judge anyone on whether they're good or bad i've mentioned it many times i think i even mentioned it in this video if i'm not mistaken but you can't go from being a critical person to loving unconditionally the way the masters are overnight. It takes time. And I do think Maitreya was telling me, and I'm telling you, I'm sharing it with you, the first step that we can all take in a very real and practical sense in our own lives, in our workplace, within our families, within our you know friends and so forth, within strangers that make us mad, with people cutting us off on the interstate, that kind of stuff a way to get the ball rolling in that direction. So as an idea, try to, you know, let's say it's a coworker that might be bugging the heck out of you, right? Well, notice one good thing, just one good thing that they did or do, and it will take your focus off of what you're being critical about. And you'll attitude, your attitude toward them will change. And I'd be willing to bet you, because I've seen that happen in my own life, their attitude toward you will change. So something to think about. But I do think that's the first step in that way. So hopefully that answered your question. But again, that question is way above my pay grade, Jacqueline. But anyway, thank you for asking it. And uh, I hope everybody does a great day. And I look forward to talking to you again in the next video. take action and help SOP save our planet. Thanks for listening. And we look forward to talking to you again in future videos. Thank you.